Hi, everyone. Welcome to our um, external demo class for um, C++ towards Yosako. And uh, good afternoon, maybe good morning at um, uh, 10 or midnight, uh, because we have uh, the registration from all around the world. And um, so before Matthew uh, gets started with his lecture today, um, uh, let me introduce me and the Bay Coding Club. You may, you guys may or may not know who is Bay Coding Club, who is Ruby Sun. So let me do the introduction right now. All right, uh, Bay Coding Club, actually we are a K-12 technology education in Silicon Valley. We bring cutting edge of computer science education to the students all around the world. We offer different kind of computer science, such as art creative courses or clubs um, for kids around five to 17. Uh, we have a lot of online courses, such as game design, like Scratch, Roblox, Minecraft. Uh, we do have the robotics courses like RFC in the future. And we also have a lot of computer language classes, such as Java, Python, and at the meantime, we um, provide computer-based of a competition like Yosako, ACSL, so the, the courses like that. So today, uh, Matthew is gonna uh, introduce you what is Yosako. So our team includes senior technology and educational experts, such as the Google engineers, Apple engineers, and Stanford professors and MIT professors and students. Matthew is one of the MIT students in computer science. And we teach right now only in English. We don't have any Chinese version of our course, but um, maybe in the future very soon, we're um, gonna provide Chinese um, version. Okay, this is our roadmap uh, we established in 2015 and then we moved to the silicon valley in 2019 as you all know we encountered with the uh, pandemic so during the pandemic we canceled all of all of our onset um, courses uh, we pushed them online so right now we only provide online courses Okay, but in the future, in this September, we're gonna provide our offline classes again at Copertino and uh, at the same time, New York, uh, upstate New York and Australian. Okay, this is me. My name is Ruby San and I'm the founder and CEO of Bay Coding Club. Uh, actually, I'm a mom with a 10 year old daughter. I uh, live um, at Silicon Valley with my husband who work at Apple as an, as an engineer. And um, I have experience of information technology field for over 20 years. And I love teach kids computer uh, science um, during our community. And this is our uh, Bay Coding Club um, courses, either online or offline. We have a lot of courses if you wanted to know more information, just log on our website at baycodingclub.com. And right now we have summer camp. Let me introduce um, the summer camp later. So we provide group lessons and semi-private lessons and one-on-one -on -one lessons. If you're interested, just log on our website. Um, this is the pathways that we designed for some of the case. Uh, we design a lot of pathways according to the interest of each of the students. If you said um, you like game design, we'll just design the game design uh, pathways for you to add some of the ingredient, ingredients about the game design inside. And uh, some of the kids are like web design, right? So we give them the pathways for web design and we also have uh, other kind of uh, uh, pathways. If you're interested, just let me know. Right now, uh, we're um, open for our registration for next month at 
Six. So just go website and do. Okay. Um. I don't know. Okay. That is pretty much all my introduction for um, the the coding club. My the other uh, line is off. It doesn't matter. I came back, and I will just give the um, turn to Matthew. So before he do the presentation, let me introduce a little bit of Matthew. Matthew is the um, MIT student, and he is really good at uh, a lot of programming languages. And he can introduce himself about the uh, characteristics about his skills. And uh, he is. This meeting is being recorded. Sorry about this. I just um, hold on. Okay, that's that's cool. <laughs> I opened two of the um, meetings, Zoom meetings, in case my Wi-Fi was off. All right, okay. I want to give the tune to um, Matthew. Matthew. All right. All right. Thank you. So yeah, uh, as you said, I'll be going to MIT in the fall for computer, for computer science. But a lot of my programming experience is centered in C++, Java, Python, Haskell, but mostly those three. And uh, I, I have experience doing a lot of game design and doing robotics in particular, as well as doing Olympiads throughout, at least for computer science and competitions throughout high school from sophomore year to now. And currently in Usico Gold, so I, I, I'm able to teach this class for you guys and hopefully I can do it well. But the way that the class is structured, it's structured in a way that you should be able to go in with knowledge of, algebra, of, of basic math and basic algebra. And you should be able to be able to go through bronze and see how it is and how to tackle the problems. And from there, go on to silver and continue on. And there are sites as well, like not directly useful, but there are sites which also supplement it, like Advent of Code, which have kit challenges in a similar way to useful, but it's a bit more approachable. So given that that's, that's me and that's what I plan to do with this course and what I, what I would want to do. And is it good if I go into the external yeah. uh, demo yeah. now? Okay. So I'll just preface it. This external demo is centered around the idea of functions basically. So if you, if you think about what, um, what functions are in like math, right? Functions are like f of x equals x squared. Like I'll just open up. Desmos right now. Like we just go into Desmos and just graph some basic functions. We know. Um, if this load a bit. Oh, first of all, Matthew, could you uh, give some of more background about what is Usico? And uh, oh yes, sorry, I forgot about that. Usico yeah. is um, it stands for USA Computing Olympiad, and it's a competition which goes in series from bronze to platinum. Where, com where competitors compete to basically achieve higher ranks. And in those higher ranks, they try to score higher and potentially reach the camp level for the US, which allows them to go to the IOI, which is International Olympiad Informatics. So the idea is that bronze is designed for those who are getting introduced to programming and are being sort of learning more of like the basic techniques and how to do it. Silver is for those who have learned the basic technique and are able to apply it to some simple, semi-simple algorithmic techniques, but they can be applied in really weird ways in contests. And then gold is adding onto that further, which is adding onto like, there are harder techniques and harder things that you can apply to problems. And it tends to use a bit more math than the other divisions did prior to the fact, which can be a bit of a slip up for a lot of people, at least it, it has been for me. And then platinum is just adding onto that. It just takes everything else and makes it much harder and it, it, it doesn't necessarily it adds a bunch some new things but a lot of the stuff is retained from gold and it just makes it a lot harder but for this course what we what we're intending to do is focus on bronze and get students ready to go on to silver if that if that makes sense i don't know if i don't know if there are any questions on that are there questions about what i said yeah how many how many um 
computer languages uh, that you can use in the use call? Oh, I don't actually know. There are a lot. There's like, at least the main ones that people use, there are C++, Java, and Python, but you're also able to use like C, you're able to use, I think you're able to use like Pascal, but the main ones people use are C++, Java, and Python. That's just the main ones that happen to be used. But there are, like, like I said, like there, you can use C in contest, you can use Pascal in contest. I think those are the only weird ones like, I can think of. Yes, right you're right. Python, Java, uh, C++, and Pascal. Yeah. 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 You're right. That's, yeah. Th those are the main ones, at least. So, mm -hmm. yeah. If there, are, are there any questions about that, about how you go structured and how we're planning to do that in our course? Any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask. Okay. No questions? All right. Um, I'm just going to send this link just if you guys want to see it as well. Uh, sorry. Oops. Okay. Actually, um, oops, wait, where is it? I found. Anyway, okay, I'll just go on to the lesson right now, actually. Sorry. So what we have, we're learning about functions and functions in programming functions similar to functions in math, right? So then it's like you have f of x equals x squared. That yields a parabola, right? That gives a parabola. And if you learn f of x equals x, that's a line. The way that functions work in C++ is similar. Although it's cooler because you're not restricted to just numbers. You can do like effectively whatever you want. But I don't know if I need to, should I send this link out? I think I should. Um, sorry, where's the chat option? Right here. You guys, if you want to access it, you can go on to that link and see if you can get it from there. That's the link to the resources we'll be using. So basically functions are things that take input and give an output. So think you can sort of think about it. Like if you have a light switch, like I have this light switch right here. You have a light, the light's on. The function, the input is you press on the light, it turns off. If I press it on again, it turns on. You can think of the input to the function as being my finger and the output as being whether or not the light works, or whether it's on or off. Oops. Oh. Sorry. Okay. So given that, we can define, see, we, we see what's allows us to, to define things like this with functions. So the first example we have here is this function here, which if you notice, this up. it's a line, right? We have f of x, equals x, or not even that, maybe a complicated. Let's just say y equals x. That's a line, right? That's just like basic algebra. But let's say we want to do something where we define a function called line. This is how we would do it in C++. We define a function called line, and we say, okay, we define a function called line, and we say, OK, in functions in math, we give it input, get an output. So we say, okay, how can we do this in C++? In C++, what you have is you have something here, which we, we, we call it int because we want the function to give us a number. We wanna say, here's an X value, give us a Y value. So then we say int line, the line is the name of our function. And we define something called X, which is the input to our function. And then we say, we wanna return X plus C, the cool thing about this, let, 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 let's just try to run this here. Let's see. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Let's just try to run line. Let's see y equals line four. It's line four. If, we're, if we know that line, this line function is this, if we know that the line function is that, if we know that line, the function we define in C++ is basically just a line in math, 
What do we expect Y to be only printed out? Are there any answers? Like if, if we have a line and we say X equals four, what do we expect Y to be on that line? Um, well, we expect it to be four, right? Because we, uh, because if y equals x, if x is 4, then y is 4. Yes, so uh, we countered some syntax errors. Let's fix this up a bit. So we say y equals line four, and we want to see what y is. This is just how you do it. You define a variable y, make it equal to line four, and you print out what y is so we can see. All right, let's just try this again, sorry. Oh, okay, we saw it here. See, it's four, right? Because if we have our line and we say, want to say x equals four, at this point here, this point is four, four, which makes sense because if our x is four, then our y should be four. Now let's try doing some other function. Like we have defined here, we defined, what is it? A parabola, right? We defined a parabola where we say c equals zero. And basically, parabola is y equals x squared, right? So notice this again, we're, we're defining a function called parabola and we have something here. It's kind of, it's gonna, it's gonna be cleared up late, late, late later, but we have something here, which is called a return type, which is like, if you have, if I give you a number, I wanna get a number back. That's what the int represents. We're saying we're given, we're giving the function a number X and we want to get the output of some number. And we're defining that function to be called parabola because it's going to be a parabola. So if we use Desmos again and we just say y equals x squared, we say we have int c equals zero. We want to return x times x plus c, where c is something that we can fiddle. We can try to fiddle around with c and see what different answers that we get. So let's see what happens. For now, c is zero. So let's see what happens if we say, Parabola five. So when we want to see what the value of the parabola is at x equals five. Zoom out a bit. Okay, so we expect it to be 25, right? Because x equals five and y equals 25. So we go here, we run it. Okay, it's 25. What do we expect it to be if x equals six then? If, if it's a problem, if it's still a problem, what do we expect the answer to be if we plug in six here? Are there any, any, any idea for what it should be? X is six. 36. Yeah, that, yeah, that's correct, 36. Because again, it's, it's a problem, I'll just reiterate, it, it's a problem. So y equals x times x. If x equals six, then six times six is 36. So yes, that is, that's correct. Just run it just to be sure. REPL takes a bit to run if it's online. So run 36. We, expect, we, we, we understand that to be true. So the interesting thing with functions though, is that we can, we, we can make any function in math that we want to do in C++ with this. But the interesting thing is that we can do things even that math can't do because math can't let us do certain things like, like make our input something that's not a number. C++ we can do that. That's how versatile it is, but we'll get into that later. Right now we're gonna to stick to having integers as inputs and integers as outputs. This is, this is the first example, but um, okay. we can also have functions as you see here, functions can have multiple inputs. Generally speaking in math, unless you're going a bit deeper into it, functions only have one input or maybe two. 
But in C++, we can maybe we can assign a function any amount of inputs that we want, as long as as much as you can type. One application of this, let's try to do this here. We let's let's try to we want to program a function that counts changes. Say we're running, I don't know, say we're run, running an, an, an ice cream shop and we're we're getting change from people paying for it. And let's say you want to say, okay, we have X amount of quarters, X amount of dimes, X amount of nickels, X amount of pennies, or X, Y, Z, W for different amounts. That's so why you want to say, okay, how much do we have in terms of dollars? Because that's a useful, that's a useful thing to know if you're going to run your business, if you want to see how much money you get from your business. So let's think about the fun functions. We can do this with functions, certainly, because what we're doing is we're just saying we have X amount of quarters, Y amount of nickel, Y amount of dimes, Z amount of nickels, and W amount of pennies. And we want to, given that, we need to return on some number in dollars, right? So how can we structure our function to do this? That's, that, that's the, I, right now, that's the main question. Because if we, if we know how we should structure the function, then we can figure out how to program it later. OK. Are there any, in, are there any things that immediately come to mind when we talk about this for, for any of you? It's fine if that's not the case, but I just want to All the see. x's and y's and c's and all those numbers. Yeah. Make, make those the inputs, you're saying. Pretty much. Okay, that's that 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 that's a good idea, because I mean there I mean there might be better ways to do it, but right now we know we can make integers as inputs of our function, so let's just do that, right? So the good name, I mean, we want our function to give us a number, right? So we wanted to have int as the signature in the point. So we want to say int, let's say money count, let's just say, and as and you suggested, we'll say int x y z w for the number of quarters, uh, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And if you're familiar with how US currency works, it's just a quarter is 25 cents, a dime is 10 cents, a nickel is five cents, or what did I say? A quarter is 25 cents, a dime is 10 cents, a nickel is five cents, and a penny is one cent. So let's just think about it. Think, let's think about it in terms of numbers, right? If we have two quarters and one dime, how much do we have in total? Well. If we have two quarters and one dime, how many? How much do we have in terms of amount? Fifty cents. Sixty. I mean, I mean, yes, six, sixty cents. Yes, six, yeah. sixty cents. How did you calculate that? You calculated that by doing what? What? Oh, um, twenty-five plus twenty-five. Yes, twenty-five plus twenty-five plus ten. Yes. Because we said there were two quarters and one dime. Okay, so we did two times 25 plus one times 10. So if we say we have X, X quarters and Y dimes, how much do we have in total? Yeah, given that logic you've just said. Well, let's think about this, right? X plus 10 Y. Exactly. Although for this case, we're gonna make it a 0.25 because we wanna consider it in dollars. Not cents. So, okay. So, one. yeah, exactly. So, um, I'll, I'll, a, a solution kind of like shows itself here, right? So, we can say, let's say our dollar count here is equal to x times 0.25 because we want it in dollars, plus y times 0.1, plus z times 0.05, plus w times 0.01, right? And then we just return. Return is basically telling us, you gave us this to our function. This is what we got out. So we have X, Y, Z, and W. When we return dollar count, we're basically saying, we're done with what we want to do. We're done with what we need to do. Here's what we got. That's the basic, that's how return works. It's in all programming languages, not just C++ or most. But let, 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 let's test this out just to see if it works. So say, um, int my money equals dollar count. Let's say we have three, two, one, zero. So we have three quarters, two dimes, or two dimes, one nickel, and zero pennies. So what do we expect that to be in terms of actual dollars? Well, okay, let's see. We have 25 times three, that's 75. Two times 10, that's 20, plus five. So then we expect, yeah, it's exactly a dollar, exactly. So if we return this, what I call it? I think I called it. What I call it? 
um, money count. Money count. Although some issues rear its head with this, that we'll see. We run this. We're not run this, but with other with other examples. Let's try to run this. Let's see what we get. So we expect it to be one, basically. If if we're smart programmers and we've done it right, we we get one. Yes. However, let's try doing something that might be a bit unruly here. Let's try to make this two. This might mess it up, but think about this, right? We have 25 times three, that's 75. We have two times 10, that's 20. So 75 plus 20 is 95 cents, plus an additional 10 cents, that's two times five. That's a dollar and five cents. But when we run it, do we expect to see a dollar and five cents? At least what do you guys think? Do you guys think when I run this, it'll say 1.05? Yes or no? It's just yes or no question. No. Yes. No. Okay. No. Why? Why do you say no? I just, I just want to see your reasoning. Probably because they didn't use des like they don't use decimals. Maybe. Let's see. Give it a bit. See what it says. You're, you're, yeah, you're, you're exactly correct. That's the issue. The issue is that we're not considering decimal places when we do this. So 1.05 and $1 are the same thing to our program. The best way to fix this basically is just in C++, there's a value, or there's a different thing we can do where we can make this, instead of making this an int, we can make this something called a double, which as you've said, as you just said, we make it a double, which is which allows for decimal places as opposed to an int, which only allows for numbers, like, like one, two, three, four, so on. If you run it like this, we, we expect to see a dollar five cents as Yaja had suggested. What? Oops. Oh, it's because, oh, I'm sorry. It's because, it's because we have to change the value down here as well. It has to be double my money as opposed to int my money. So we run this and dollar five cents. So yes, you're correct. Okay. So we, so far we've seen functions that can return ints or doubles. But the important thing is that functions can take any amount of parameters we give them. We can put, we can say, here are our billion inputs, take all a billion inputs and give me something from them. So it doesn't matter the amount, the amount is completely arbitrary for C++. Okay. So what, we'll see another way, another cool thing we can do with them. So we did something using basic, basic multiplied and we added. Let's try something else where we where we're returning something that isn't necessarily an integer type or double type. This is important because it's not directly linked to math, at least a, a basic math. So in C++, there are things called booleans or bool, which if you look here, it's basically just, we can define a boolean variable, which is basically either true or false. It's on and off. Your light switch is either on or off. It's not 50% on, 50% off, unless you have a faulty light, light bulb. But the basic idea is bool, like we like we we can define a boolean, and we can either set it to be true or false. And that's it. It's I mean that's it's a, it's as simple as it gets. This is like probably the simplest variable you could probably use, but that's basically it. it's true or false, on or off, like switch. So okay, so we know booleans are either true or false. So we can use it for making like logic. Like we can say, is it going to rain today? Yes or no? Yes. So. We can use this to try to do something with numbers, right? So let's see. We want to make a function. So let's say we're, we're like mathematicians or something. And we want to, we have three numbers. We have some three ma no, some magical numbers. We have A and B and C. And they're all, they don't have to be different, but let's just say they're all different numbers. We're interested in seeing if the sum of A and B is divisible by C. That's the interesting thing for us. Because as mathematicians, we like to, to look into esoteric things and confusing things. So we, we don't care either way. So what we say is we want to make a function, which as you can see here, I provided this like signature for it because it might be a bit confusing, but we have a function which is called is divisible, which returns a boolean, which is returning true or false on and off for light switch. And it takes a, it takes the input of an A, a B, and a C, which if you look at the example above here, we want the function to return true if the sum of two ints a plus b is divisible by c. The question is, how do we do this? 
C++, how can we do this? The answer isn't direct based on what we know right now, but I'll, I'm, I'm just gonna introduce the idea of this, this um, percentage sign, which the, the important thing for us is if we have two numbers, num1 percentage sign, num2, and that is equal to zero, then they're both divisible by each other. So the basic idea to see is like, we have like int a is equal to, let's just do this down here actually. We, we say int a is equal to six percentage three. We wanna print out what that is. We know that three divides six, right? Because six divided by three is two. Just basic math, we know three goes into six two times. So because they're divisible, we expect this to be zero. That's the important thing for that function. You don't need to know the complicated stuff about it, but that's all that matters about it. If it's zero, then they're divisible. And as you see here, it's zero. So how can we use this for our function? If we have some A, B, if we wanna check if A plus B is divisible by C, how can we use the percentage sign to do that? Are there any, any, any immediate ideas? Okay. That, that, that's okay, that's okay as well. So let's think about this, right? Maybe you can just do the same thing, but with the six, you can make it the A plus B, and with the three, you can make it C. That's, that's exactly correct, that's exactly the answer. So as Andrew said, we can do this in a way where we'll say int our answer is exactly what he said, A plus B, percentage sign C. And based on what we, what we saw before with the six and the three, if that is equal to zero, then C divides A plus B. So what we care about is we care about returning, like let's say Boolean bool result, let's say it's equal to false initially, because we, we can set our Boolean value to be either true or false. And we can use something called, uh, I mean, I, uh, I won't go deep into this, but they're basically just like conditionals here that we can use to check if our answer is zero. And then we can set result to be, to be true according if that's the case. But the important thing to see with this example is not that it's not the conditional statement because the important thing to see is we have inputs A and B and C. And we have our answer variable, which we set to be A plus B mod C. It must be percentage sign C, as Andrew said. And then basically we just say, we want to check if our answer is zero, because if our answer, if our answer equals zero, then A plus, then C divides A plus B. And that's what we want, that's what we want for our function. So we check if our answer is zero, then we set our, our Boolean variable to be true. And then we return the result otherwise. Uh, so let me change this to return result. Now well, let's try this for different inputs, let's see. A good, a good example to try, let's try five, five, seven, three. And let's try, Let's see, let's try four, seven, six. Well, given, given these functions, what do we expect the answers to be for each of them? If we look at five is A, seven is B, for, for the first example, let's go for the first one. Do we expect it to be true or false? Well, okay. We have five is A, seven is B, three is C. Five plus seven is 12. C is three and three divides 12. So we expect it to be true, right? Because 12 divided by three is four. And as we all know, if 12 divides by three is four, then the percentage, then 12 percentage sign three should be zero because they, they divide each other. If that makes sense. Uh, are there any questions about how that all worked all together? How, how, how the percentage sign worked and how we did our function? Let's go back up to it just so we can see it again. Are there any questions about this? Are, are, are there any conceptual parts about this 
pure misunderstandings about how this should work. Okay, I'll take that as understanding. Okay. So back to the question here. We have five plus seven, where five is A, seven is B, three is C. Five plus seven is 12, C is three. 12 divided by three is four. So they divide into each other. So we expect this to be true. How's it become this? This to be true. However, for ret two, four plus seven is 11. And 11 divided by six doesn't work out. You have one and you have a remainder of five. So, okay. So we know modulus is not going to be zero because they're not divisible by each other. So therefore we expect this to be false. Although we should probably just say, okay, let's let this run and we'll see. Okay, so the way that this is, the way that C++ processes stuff is a bit weird, but uh, ignore this 1.05 right now. The one, one in C++ represents true. It's just, I'll come at this here as well. We'll print out one because one is true. C++ one, in C++ one represents true and Zero represents false. So that's what these printouts mean. So if you're ever using it and you're trying to debug some Boolean stuff, if you print out a Boolean statement, if it's true, it'll print out one. If it's false, it'll print out zero. But that's, that's not directly related to the lesson here. That's just related to the specific application we're trying to do. Okay. So we have this func function done. Um, okay. So what, what, what can we do to try to improve this maybe? Like let's think about some weird cases that could happen with our fun function. Like let's say we have some weird stuff that tries to happen. Like let's say, what do we know about how zero works with division? Like what is one divided by zero? That, that, that's a good question for this. What is one over zero? As in, is it, is it, is it a number? It's one over zero a number? Is three over zero I don't number? Know. Usually don't put anything over zero. It doesn't really work out. Exactly. It doesn't work out because you can't. I mean, you're you're basically asking how much can zero go into a number? It's basically infinity. It doesn't really make sense. So what if we try it? What 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 what, what if we just want to see how it works with our phone function? Like what if we say we want our c to be zero? What what will it say? What will it do? We 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 don't even know. We 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 we've put in this fun function, we don't know what it's gonna do. So let's see. Hmm. Oh, okay, we got an error here. Of course, we expected this because we are C++ programmers and we know how it works. But we get this error because th th this is just an important thing to note when you're trying to make fun functions. You have to consider cases of inputs that could mess it up, right? So when our, when our, when our C is zero, when our C is zero, we're basically saying, we're trying to divide, in this example, we're trying to divide 11 by zero. So that doesn't work out. So let's just say if c equals zero, it doesn't work because we can't divide by zero. So that's just an important thing to note about that because dividing by zero just doesn't tend to work out anywhere in any application. Also okay. a little bonus, 11 is a prime number. That, that is, it is also a prime number. So it wouldn't work for any c besides one in itself. So yeah, that's, that is also true. Okay, so let's get to a more practical application of functions. So let's say we were, we're game designers as well. We, we, we're not only mathematicians, but we're also game, design, game designers. So we're trying to make a game. And in a lot of games, especially pretty old games, I, ha I have it open right now, but in old games like Sokoban or Legend of Zelda, well, well Sokoban is just like, you're just pushing um, what uh, crates around and you're just trying to get them to certain positions. 
but that 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 doesn't matter for this. The idea of it is like if you think about how a grid is or is organized, you can move like up, left, down, or I mean, well, well, from here you can move up, left, right, up, up, left, right, or down. So you can move in the four directions, right? What we what we want to say is let's say we're making a game, which imagine that there are no boxes here, so. Uh, Uh, just uh, imagine there are no boxes here. That, that this is just an entirely complete space. We want to say, if if our player is here, you see how how our uh, our player is in the bottom cell. We want to say, we want to make a function. Basically, if you look at this, we want to design a function, which tells us if we can make a move from one position to another. So if, let's say if we're at some cell position, we want to move to one that's directly above it. We should say, yeah, you can do that because assuming we're assuming there are no obstacles, we're just saying if basically if two positions are within one unit of one another, if they're within one distance of one another, then you can complete the movement because you can go from here to here. But if it's like all the way out here, something like here, you can't go directly in one movement, right? So if we go back to so Sokoban, right? If we take our player over here, it's open space, we can reach the positions above us, beneath us to the left of us or to the right of us in one motion. That's the important thing. So what we can try to do is, given that, we can try to make a function which does that. And I've defined the signature here as well, just so you guys can try to fiddle around with, with it if you, if, if you want to. So we have a function which returns, again, returns a Boolean for us, which is like true or false, light switch on or off, yeah? And we define, we call it is reachable. And we want to, we wanted to give the function for to four inputs, right? So we want the, the first input to be like where the player is, right? So we want to say x1, y1 is where our player is. We want to say x2, y2 is where we want to go. And we want to say if we can reach x1 from x1, y1, if we can go to x2, y2 in one move. That's the basic question. The question is, how can we do this using C++? Well, the, the good thing we want to do is we want to basically see if we can move or if the cell that we're going to move to is to the right of us, above us, left of us, or beneath us, right? So, so with our play, we can move in these four directions. And we need to, we need to basically put that into C++. And this requires, I mean, to do it simply, you need some, some other knowledge, but there are some, there's some like distance stuff you can do where if we do this, this allows us to do this, if we say this. And this distance represents the, the, the distance between X1, Y1 and X2, Y2. But the important, the important thing to see is we wanna see if the distance is less than or equal to one in this case. So how should I do this? Are there any questions? I mean, are there any ideas for how I can finish up this function? So to just to continue, we have we have a variable which we have a variable which tells us how far we are from one cell to another. What we want to do is we need to check that distance and see if it's less than or equal to our desired distance variable here. So what we're gonna need is, it's gonna rear its head again. We're going to end up needing to do, we need to end up using an if. But what's the condition here? That's the big question here. What do I put here in order to get is good to be true? Are there any? Are there any ideas for what I should do? Or, or if you have an idea, just type it directly into here if you're in here already. Nope. Well, okay. But let me just think, 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 think about it, right? We want to check if our distance is, is equal to some desired distance, right? And the way that we did that before in, in the previous example, we checked if our answer is equal to zero with this, right? 
So by saying that, we said, if our answer is equal to zero, then we change our result variable. That's basically what we have to do again, right? Because we're just checking if our distance is equal to some other di di distance, and we set it to be true. So let's just see. If I, if I just go and copy paste this here, put this here. We're checking if what equals what. In, in this example, what are we checking? Uh, are there, are there any ideas? What, what are we trying to check for in terms of distance and desired distance? You're checking for walls. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I actually, well, 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 what we want to check for is we want to check if our, if the distance between, if we want to check if distance is equal to desired distance. That's the basic idea of our fun function. So we want to define, like we did before, we want to define a bool, which is just called this good. I'd say that's false. But the main part of this function, everything else doesn't matter anymore. Well, for, forget about everything else. What we care about is what do we have to put here in order to get this to work? That, that's the key question, what goes here? And if we think about what we want, we want to check if distance equals desired distance, right? And how we do that is how we did it before. It's the same one. If we look how we did before, we said, oh, wait, what? Oh, wait, wait. Right. This is back again. If we look at this again, we checked if our result is equal to zero with the double equal sign. So let's just do the same thing here, but we check with result instead of that, that result is distance and zero is desired distance for the example we have below. So you can see the examples are sort of building on each other here. So let's do this is distance, desired distance. And if, if they're equal, then we just say is good is true, and then we return is good. So let's just let, let, let's try out our function. Let's, let's uh, test it out. Let's see. Let's say bool result equals um, is reachable. Let's say we're starting from some position 0, 1, and we're moving to a position 1, 1. We expect that to be true or false. That's the first thing. What do we expect the answer to be? Well, if you think about it in terms of a grid, right? In terms of like the x, y plane, right? You have x equals zero, y equals one, and you have x equals one, y equals one. Both of those are within one distance of another, right? Because if you're at zero, one, you just move to the right. So we expect, let's just go on de decimals and we'll see it here. We'll say x equal, we'll say um, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 1. Both these points here are directly next to one another. So because of that, their distance between each other is 1. We can just move to the right. So we expect the answer to be yes. If we try another example where we have is reachable 0, 1, 3, 3, the answer is going to be no, right? Because zero one or three three cannot be reached from zero one in one move. That's just obvious. So let's just print those out. Hello, the cool thing about this function and how we did it is we can try to mess around with desired distance. Because in a game, you might not always want to be able to only move like one away. You might be able to want to move like three away or four away or five away, something along those lines. And all of that is basically just done by changing this. So if we change this to be, well, let's say five, at least for the case of one, zero, three, three. Well, about, yeah, let's change it to be five. If we change it to be five, we run it. Let's see, what, what do we expect? We expect, oh, what? Zero, one, three, 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 three. 
Oh, wait, what? Oh, let's change the, what we had it for. Let's run this again. Zero, one. So that means that what that means is this was true. That, that's what that means. And it kind of makes sense, right? If you think about how we defined our distance, we, we defined it based on taking the difference between x1 and x2 and y1 and y2. Let's scroll back up. x1 and x2, y1 and y2. So x1 was 0, x2 was uh, 3. So this is 3. And then, x, and then x, y1 was 1, and y2 was 3. So then this is two. So then the total distance is five, which makes sense. So um, okay. are there any are there any questions about it in any any of what we done? Are there any, any questions about it? Because I want to be sure that you, you guys understand what the function is and how it was intended to work. Uh, Okay, so okay. so far we've basically been talking about functions where they can return an integer or, or they can return an int or they cannot return an int and they can take input that's just one int or they can take input that's multiple ints. Now we're gonna consider um, fun fun function input that's not just int. We can give an input to a function of something that isn't necessarily an int, which is not related to math. We can do it with C++. So let's see. We basically, well, what we can do for this is we can use something called a string in C++. And strings in strings C++ are the equivalent of English words. So if you look here, we have, we, we, we define a variable my string equals, we say string my test string string my string equals my test string. So we assign the, this, 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 this value to my string, right? So the basic idea of strings is you need to put quotations on both ends so the computer knows it's a string. But we don't have to, but they don't have to be words anyway. I mean, it can be gibberish. It doesn't have to be actual English. So we can just string gibberish string equals this. And this is not a word this is, it doesn't have to be actual words either way. The computer doesn't know. But the important thing about strings is that we can, we can look at the individual things in them, basically. So if we have, a, if we have, we go back to what we define my string equals chicken, we, we, we define it to be cherry chicken. Then the, this is kind of important. We know if we look at each individual character in the string, each individual letter in the string, the first letter of the string is accessed with this. My string zero is equal to C. My string one is equal to H. My string two is I and so on. But the important thing, I mean, the only thing that matters about this is it lets us figure out what the value is of a certain character at some in, in a string basically. So if you have string ch chicken, the first character you access with my string zero. The second character you access with my string one. The third character you access with my string two, and you use these these you use these brackets here. So this is basically the building block for what we're going to do for everything using strings after this. Uh, are there any questions so far about my explanation or my kind of crash course on how strings work here? Yeah. I mean, the important the, the most important thing here is just to not get confused by how to use the numbers here because the first character in the string is zero. It's the zeroth character. The second character is the first character. And the third character is the second character in terms of how to put the index here. So by saying my string zero, we're accessing the first character here and so on. That's, that's a bit confusing initially, but when we use it, we'll see. Let's, let's start off in order to test our knowledge of this. Let's say we wanna make a function which is called string index and we want the function to take an input that is we want to take and take a string as input and an index as input and we want to basically say given some string 
you want to find the character at some index, right? So a good example for this is what? We have a string here. We have a string called my string, which is ch chicken again. If we, we know that the my string four is equal to K because I'll, I'll just write it out directly. Yeah, C H I C K N zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. K is four. K, K here corresponds to the fourth index. A string. So we know my string four is K. So what we want is we want our function to take an input of a string and a number and give us the character at that position. So we know my string four is K. So this string returns K or this function returns K. We know my string at index zero is equal to C. So string index my string comma zero should return C. The question is, how can we do this? Using the bracket thing that we were in before, using this notation here, how can we make this function work? That's the question. Are there any, are there any immediate ideas that come, that come to people's mind when we talk about this or no? If not, that's fine. If I, if, if I, if I need to reiterate something, please, please say, just if you have any confusion. Yeah, that, 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 that's okay, that's okay. So, well, if we wanna think directly about how we did this before, we, we have my string four and that equals K. A good thing to say, a good thing to try to do with fun functions is we wanna define our return value before. We wanna just say we have some, some char we wanna, we have some character we wanna return and that's equal to something initially. It can be whatever we want, it doesn't matter. So then we, what we want to say is, we want to say that we know that S index, if we do this, S, if, if we do S bracket index, because the string we're considering is S, it's this, string S, and we're considering and in a number which is an index, or let's just say position POS. If we do S POS, S POS is the is uh, is the letter at the position POS. That's the important thing to see with this, I think. Because imagine if S, imagine we give S to be my string and position in pos is four. My string four gives the character at index four. That's, that's how strings work, right? So, okay. I know that that gives me the letter at the position, but how can I use it for my function? What, what can I do from here? Are there, are there, are, are there any suggestions for what I, what, what I should do from here? Well, a good thing to do for this is we want to use SPOS, right? Because we know it works in our program. So let's see, we have our return value defined already, and we know that it should be equal to SPOS. So let's just set it equal. Let's just return it. Simple as this. This is just the basic thing we had to see. The basic observation is that if we have a string S and we have a, a position pause, that's enough for us to get the character at that position. We can just do S pause and use that. But the important thing to see again with what, with what we tried before is how can we break this function? Because the way that we have it done now is not fully correct. As in the, the big question is, can, can you spot a potential issue in the current function? Try different values for pause, for which the function might fail. So what values for pause do you think the function might fail? Let's say S equals chicken. Let's say that, that let's say, um, let's 
let's say we're passing chicken into our function regardless. So we're just making s chicken here. Are there any values for this that you can see that could fail? The second C. Hmm? Num ah. Uh, like what? What? Number four. You're uh, well, like you're uh, you're you're saying if pause is four, then the function wouldn't work. The second C might fail. The second I, well, what I what what I'm meaning is like. What if like what 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 value for for pause could you say that would make the function like mess itself up a bit? Like let's think the thing about s if if it's ch chicken right, the chicken string has how many characters in it? It has c h i c k e n seven. There are seven characters in the string. Okay, so we expect to be able to only consider characters within a certain range, right? So, so we can only look at like, if, if we have our my string, we can, and it's the string chicken here, go back up here. We have chicken, we have our position zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. We can only access the characters that are in our string. So what happens, at least for my string, or at least for this string here, this ch ch chicken string, What's a potential value for pause that could fail, basically? That you guys can potentially think of. Probably any letter that isn't in chicken. Hmm. Oh, well, okay, let's see. What if we make pause to be a really big number? Let's say it's a big number. Let's say it's a million. Will that work for chicken? Well, no, no, it wouldn't, right? Why, why wouldn't it work? It wouldn't because chicken is six, um, is yeah, six, seven, 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 um, letters. And so if you want to put big, if you put bigger than seven, it won't work. Yeah, that's exactly right. If, if, if you try to access a character that's out of your string and it won't work, it won't, won't be able to do it in the same way. What if pause is negative? This is specifically C++, but if pause is negative, then it gets confused as well. Like, what does it mean if you have, if you want to access the negative one character? That doesn't mean anything, right? So if, uh, if we say pause is negative or really big, then we don't think it's going to work. But the way that we've done our function right now is it's going to try to do it regardless. So let's just try to run this here. Let's say, Um, I call it string index. String index chicken. Let's say it's, let's say we try a hundred here. What do we let's say we what do we think is going to happen? Let's see. Because there are, there are some things that could happen, but. Oh, so as you can see here, printed out nothing, which is already a problem because we know our string is like, we know we have a full string. So this is just a technicality of how memory works. But don't worry about that. The thing that matters is this is weird. This is wrong. This shouldn't happen. We should expect to see a number, a, a letter here, or something that's in our string there. So if we say 100, it, it messes up. If we try to do negative one, because it's negative, we, we don't think it's decimals. That, that's a good, yeah, actually that's it's good as well. If we try to do decimals, what do we expect? Well, given what we yeah. saw before, given what we saw before with what you jotted said, with the, with the, uh, with, the, with the money calculator, when we set an integer equal to be, like if we say here, int this equals one point or three point, is pi. We say this. What do we think is going to happen if we print out deck? Deck is not. Deck is certainly going to be what then? We can print, print, print it out. We can see. I'm coming. I'll come in this out just so we can show this as a point. 
we set it equal to 3.14159265, the, the program has an issue immediately because it's seeing that it's taking an input of some decimal, but it's trying to change it to an end. What that implies is that, well, let, let's do what Andrew suggested. Let's see, because we want to see what we're, 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 we're experimenting. Let's say I pass this into the function. Let's see what it says. The sense take a bit to it out because it's just it's online. So it, there, there's an issue immediately. It gives us a warning because it's taking an, an, a double, it's taking a, a, a decimal and trying to make it an integer. But as you can see, it doesn't matter because it's it's basically converting this into an into a number by just taking off all the decimal places here. So passing in this is the same thing as just passing in three, just to answer your question though. So it doesn't cause an error explicitly, but it's gonna cause a weird behavior that we don't intend. So yeah, that, that's good to know. We wanna try to avoid dad decimals, negative signs, or really big numbers. So that's just important to see for this. And okay, th this is the... Um, the main application of this. This is the main application of how to use strings. And probably the more like more weird one, but that's a good story. So, okay, let's say that we like we like words. We like words a lot. Particularly, let's say we like to see how many syllables a word has. Like we know um, certain words have a certain amount of syllables. And like for instance, phone. Phone has one syllable. It's just phone. Notebook. Notebook has uh, uh, two syllables. Notebook. And but we care about, we like words a lot, but tend, we tend to like words that have less syllables more, but we view all words as equal because it's all English. But a good way to try to count the number of syllables in a word is to count the number of vowels in a word. That, that, that's just a, generally a good way to do it. So like if you have words like water or pencil, you have water, pencil, both of those have two syllables and they have two vowels in them, right? Water has A and E, pencil has E and I. However, you, you can encounter some weird examples where that doesn't work or examples that where that doesn't work. Like for instance, headlight doesn't work because headlight has three vowels, but two syllables, right? So, but we don't care about this. We don't care that there are some ways that it don't, that, that, that doesn't work or does work. All we care about is we want to make a function that is able to determine, that is able to find an amount of syllables in some word. That's all we care about right now. So, we have the we have the function like signature defined for us here. We want our function to return a number. We call it syllable count, and we the only parameter we give it is we give it the parameter of some word. We want it to give be given a word like so. We give it the word like uh, like I said before. We give it the word notebook. We want it to be able to go through that word and look at individual characters in it and be able to say, oh. Um, if is this a, is this a vowel? If it is, then yeah, we add it out. We, we we add it. If not, then we skip it. That's what we have to do. We're trying to count the number of vowels in a word. And the way that you do this in C++ programming, that are that are, I mean, I provided it here, but we can basically do something called a for loop. But this isn't so important right now. It's basically a for loop which lets us look at each character in the string individually. So we can sort of do like we can sort of just scan the string. Uh, letter by letter. So if we have the word notebook, we, we still look at the N, we look at the O, we look at the T, we look at the E, we look at the B, we look at the O, we look at the O, we look at the K. So this function allows us to do that. And what, and this cur, this cur is equal to, is equal to the current character we are looking at. But the, the, uh, the important thing, for us right now is this is filling in the this bracket here it's filling in this parentheses here right so we're trying to count the number of vowels that occur in some word 
how can we do that using this? That, th 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 this is just a, a general que question here. Given how we've made this function, how can we try to count the number of vowels? Any, uh, any, any ideas given what we have right here? Search the letters for, search the entire word for vowels. Exactly. And what are the vowels? What, what, what are the vowels that exist in, A -E -I -O -U. in English? Exactly, A-E-I-O-U. So we want to check for some current character if it's equal to A or it's equal to I or it's equal to E or it's equal to O or it's equal to U. The way that we can do that here is, okay, let's say we have, we have, we need to check, basically we need to check five different, or four, you know, five different ways. Okay, so we want to we want to put something after all of these double equal signs here to check if it's a vowel. What should I? What should we put there? Are there any, any ideas for what should we, we should put there? As if 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 we, if we go by what Andrew said. A I O U. Yeah, A I O U. So we put that here. This is the most important thing to see. The, the, the double bracket thing, or like the double pipe sign here, is the equivalent of doing an or. It's, 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 it's comparing two Boolean values, right? So if we want to say like, let's do a quick example here. Make sure it's clear. But we do Boolean like, or bool, um, bool result, bool my result. But the way that it works is if you have some true value and you do the double the, the double pipe with false, it's still gonna end up being true. If you do it with, with, with two trues, it's still true. It's only false when everything in it is false, when every single Boolean is false. And this is important for our example because we can do this for a bunch of different booleans. So we can say like boolean. If we say true, double pipeline, false, double pipeline, false, double pipeline, false. This will still end up being true because one of the values was true. And this makes sense for how our vowel thing works, right? Because if a character, a character is either, if a character is A, or it's E, or it's I, or it's O, or it's U, then it's a vowel. We know it's a vowel. If, if, it's, if it's any of those, it's a vowel. So that's, that, that, that's a natural way to check it. And if, for those Please, of you that doctor, are- Doctor, how will we tackle the Y situation? Oh, that's a good question as well. How we tackle Y? Well, we can consider Y as a vowel as well, if you like. The only thing is like, I mean, obviously, why the why is a vowel oh, no. changes based on context, but whatever, whatever. Let, let, let's let's add it in. Let's add in why. We don't, we don't care either way. It doesn't matter because we're we're just trying to get a rough idea of like how many syllables a word has. And okay, just just a conceptual question here. We have a counter value here. It's equal to zero. We're saying if our current character is a vowel, we, we increment our counter, we, we add one to it. So if it's zero, it becomes one. If it's one, it becomes two. 
what do we return for our function? What does our function want to be given out? It wants to know what? In terms of our, in terms of how we, in terms of the variables we have here, what should I return? If, 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 if how many if vowels I'm, in that word? Yeah, the number of vowels. What, what, what in our, what in our function is the number of vowels? Like what, like what variable in our function is the number of vowels? Well, if we look at the code a bit, just let, well, if we just look at it directly here, we have to check if cur is a vowel, then we add to counter. So counter is maintaining the number of vowels that we've seen so far, basically. So if we know that that's the case, then what should we be returning at the end? If, if if we know that counter represents the number of vowels. I'm sorry, what? Well, we, sh we should return counter, right? That, that's the most intuitive thing to do. It's the only variable we really have here besides maybe cur, but we're not returning a character, right? We're returning an int. So, if we return counter, then we should be able to count the number of syllables or get, get an idea of the amount of syllables in a word, which is good. We, we, that, that, that's what we wanted. We wanted to see the number of syllables we have in a word based on counting vowels. So let, 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 let's, we, I mean, we spent a lot of time on it. Let's see what we get. Let's see what the result is. And num syllables equals So you want to syllable count. Well, so we want to try the word. Let's try um. Let's try what we did before. What we say. Let's try check ch ch chicken again. Why not? And we expect this to be what? We see C H I C K E N. Only I and E are the vowels there. So we expect it to print out two. Let's try another one. Let's try one, well, let's try pterodactyl. Let's also try, well, let, let's try doing headline as well from the previous example. So we'll, let, we'll just see, just, just for fun, let's just see how, how good our function is to like count the number of Hmm? How about trying cicada? Cicada, that's good. Yes, cicada is a good idea. Sorry, cicada. Okay. We just wanna we wanna pronounce what the values are. So well, let's just see what, 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 what the values we get are for fun and to see if our function's good. Okay, let's see. So for chicken, actually, for, 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 for chicken, we ended up getting two. For pterodactyl, we ended up getting four, which is actually good, I think. Pterodactyl, that's actually correct. For headlight, we ended up getting three, which is wrong, right? Because you have head, light, that's two syllables. And for cicada, you end up getting three as well. You have cicada. So our function is actually pretty decent, it seems. It seems that it got three out of four of them. I mean, it seems, it seems to be fine, but there are certainly other examples that wouldn't work. For instance, like if you just try, just think of any compound word and it probably won't work. Like warehouse, 
yeah where, for like warehouse for instance like um whatever like i mean okay i mean that's that, that that's besides the point anyway the important thing is we made a function which takes a word we together made a function which takes a word and can count the number of syllables in it based on just counting vowels and it's still pretty good even though for how simple it is are there any are there any questions about that? About what what about what what we were just doing? No, but I have a word that will get way more than how many syllables it has. All right, what's the word? Birdhouse. Uh, I'll just print out the word with it as well, just so it's easy. It's going to give you twice the amount of syllables it is. Just... We'll see. I'll just format this as well so it's easier to read. Birdhouse ended up giving us three. Wait, try to oh, wait, sorry, I didn't run it. Birdhouse and yeah, but Birdhouse, we ended up getting four. But the amount is two, right? So bird house, but but based on our function, we counted what well, we counted to see um four different um vowels. We see we saw I, O, U, and E. So yeah, it's it, it doesn't work for the amount of syllables, but it ended up for how we made our function, it ended up working. So that's a, it's just different types of errors in our code. But yeah, that's that that that's a good example of something for which our function doesn't work on. But okay. Are there any any quiet questions? This is this is the um end of the external demo lesson. But I I, I mean I, I just wanted to note as well in terms of actual content for the class. This is be using information that we would we would certainly learn more about later. Like for instance, we would we would learn more about conditionals, like if, like if statements, we would certainly learn more about functions, at least like in a slower pace than this, because it's only given an hour and I wanted to introduce you guys to how functions work in C++ and how cool they are. And, but in terms of how an actual class would be structured, we would learn how to do conditionals, we would learn how to use them in, in code, and then we would learn how to use them in functions, and then we would learn how to apply that to Usico and how to use that for different problems in bronze. But the, the, but this external demo is reflecting is is reflecting of content that we will, will be in our in the class inevitably. So that that's an important thing to note as well because this this isn't certainly this certainly isn't directly meant to be like you have an internal direct understanding of the theory of functions and stuff. This is just oh functions are interesting and in the course we can learn how to apply them to cool things, particularly for you go and other projects. So that's. That's that's an important thing pertaining to this. But other than that, are there any questions about the course, about this, about what we what we'll do? Any questions about Yosuko? About preparation for Yosuko? I believe everybody um, attended today's um, presentation has reached the level to uh, attend uh, the this class because we don't uh, really uh, uh, require any of the foundation of the programming. Yeah. But I believe uh, all of you has some of uh, programming basics. So that will be a plus, right? Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the only direct 
prerequisite is a, is a basic understanding of algebra of, of some algebra and some like uh, like uh, arithmetic stuff. But in terms of programming, you don't need to directly know and need to know a lot of things. But if you do, it it helps because we're going to be going over it in the course and we're going to be trying to use it for use though primarily and for basic programs particularly. So yeah, that helps. Yeah. Yeah, normally if you uh, attend um, Yosuko Bronze, I believe uh, most of you can, can pass. Yeah, yeah, there's um, a better, I mean, uh, easier than other levels, I believe, than silver, than gold. Oh well, yeah, with practice you can, you can pass. Yeah, should be, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, and uh, when we um, got the registration form, we do have uh, gathered uh, some of uh, the questions to ask you about um, the Yosuko and you about, about other questions. Um, yeah, so Matthew, are you ready to answer that kind of, kind yeah, of question sure. from registration yeah. form? Yeah, yeah, some, some, of, them, some of them are uh, ask uh, how old or what grade uh, can register uh, your scope bronze. Yeah, kind you of can, similar as like the prerequisites, yeah. You can start in really any grade. I started pretty late. I, I, I started doing USACO in 10th, in mid 10th grade. So I started pretty late, but you mm -hmm. can start in middle school even. You don't need to start in, in high school. You can start from any age. They don't have an age bound. I know there's someone there are, there, are, there are people who have done it in like fifth grade, sixth grade, and have a great success in it. And there are people that have done it late like me and have also encountered great success in it as well. So it's just a matter of how much you're, how much you're willing to work for and how much you're willing to study and do in it. But other than that, there's no real age limit, really. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, I believe I, I, only you're only 10. Are you? Yeah. Okay. So... Who are uh, you, and Angel? I, I, Angel I, I, are you are a Bay Coding Club uh, student, Angel Liu? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, it's not Angel. It's not Angel Liu of uh, Bay Coding Club. We have um, a very uh, advanced student called Angel. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I believe uh, from ten years old. Oh, there's another questions about uh, the application of. MIT. Um, one mom said, "Ask, um, is it uh, Yosuko helped your uh, application of uh, your University of MIT?" Uh, it certainly it helped. It, it certainly did help. I think it did help. I mean, I, I mean, I can't say what the admissions officer said about it, but I can certainly say in terms of my ability to think about problems and be able to solve problems, Yosuko certainly did help. And it helps in not only that, but it just helps in be able to developing a good work ethic to be able to sort of like. See, if you see a problem in terms of an Olympiad, right? You're given a problem, you're given time to work on it. It's only you and that problem for like what four or five hours. So you have to look at the problem, you have to try to solve, solve it, and you have to think about it. But in doing that, you not only be able to, you're, you're not only able to get experience in like solving problems and solve and learn, learning different algorithmic techniques. That that's the important thing. But you're also able to develop a good work ethic and be able to translate that to other things. Like, I mean, I can certainly say doing used to go and doing olympiads and, and con contests like, 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 like that helped me to be able to work more on my important to be able to develop a work ethic to work on other projects as well like for instance i spent i think i i, I might have talked about this before but i was on from for my frc team which is based in philadelphia area we have uh, during our off season this year since this year was a bit weird due to covid restrictions and such we were able to spend, or I was able to spend, a season working on doing some um, autonomous path plan planning stuff for our team. So I was able to develop a, a, a framework for our code. It's able to allow our team to basically be given a map, given some obstacles in the map, and have our robot be able to plan a path to go basically wherever it wants to in the in the, in the path you know, in, in the map. So we're planning to use that for next year, or at least our team is, given the people that are still there. And mm -hmm. I think doing use ago, at least for me personally, doing use ago certainly has helped my application directly because it looks good. And it also helps indirectly because it, it, it affects every other aspect of your academic life and if you do it well. And also, I just wanted to clarify, I, I didn't start doing use ago at 10 years old. I started at year 10. So I was probably like 15 or 16 or not. Okay. No, I was 15. I was 15 years old. Okay. So there is the last question from the registration form. Um, 
do you do you think what kind of uh, mathematics level should attend Yosuko? I mean, it really depends. It, it's just if if for bronze, you don't need that much math. Probably only like basic algebra. Be able to multiply numbers. Be able to divide num numbers, add them, subtract them. For silver, you might need some more complicated math because you need to be able to. Or and it's not that much more complicated, but the application could be more complicated. So for bronze and silver, the math isn't that bad. It's not usually awful. The math is usually like it's usually decent. For gold, on the other hand, gold math is usually there. Are, there are some some things in discrete math that tend to rear its head in gold. For instance, there are certain years or there are certain problems that were like problems with. I think it's the, the property of inclusion exclusion, which is something in in discrete math. As well as some some general combinatorics and counting tech techniques that you encounter in gold, and platinum is just it's whatever it's fair game effectively anything it's not college level I think I mean even college level but yeah that's the math is generally bronze silver math is usually decent gold math is it's harder and platinum math mm -hmm. tends to be hardest. Okay, okay thank I you. Feel like I'm gonna leave. Bye. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, pretty much all for the um, presentation for today, I believe. Um, if you um, still have questions, you can open your Mac and to ask. If you're not aware, I think we're good for today. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we'll just contact with you if you guys want to register for this bronze um, class or uh, you give any feedback from um, Matthew's uh, demonstration for today. Yeah. All right, um, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I believe, um, yeah, in the future, some of uh, the attendants for today is gonna be your students. Okay, yeah. thank you all for participants for today. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, I think uh, if they don't have question, we're good to go. I have one question. Okay, go right. ahead. So for the for the Yosuko test, it's only three levels, like a bronze and a silver it's, and a gold, or is it like um, ACSL there, each one has a different uh, level as well? There's bronze, there's silver, there's gold, and there's platinum. Platinum was added like 2015, 2016, the highest used to be gold, but. Platinum is now the highest in vision, but it goes from bronze and you go to you promote to silver, from silver you promote to gold, from gold you promote to platinum. So that's, what is a typical, do they have an age, like uh, all great, like um, restriction, like uh, for ACSL, they typically recommend for the, there is a elementary level, junior level and a junior intermediate level. Is that uh, anyone can join like um, any level or it's, uh, it doesn't matter? Well, uh, in 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 Yusuko, you start out at bronze. So you started at bronze. You have to promote silver by getting a certain score in a certain in a con in a contest. Like for, for most contests, for instance, the highest score you can get is a thousand. If you get a thousand, then you can do, automatically go up to the next division. But in Yusuko, you have you you start in some division. You promote based on getting a certain score. So for instance, the the average score threshold in Yusuko is around 750, 700. So if you, if you reach that score, then you generally go up to the next division. So if you're in bronze, you go up to silver. If you're in silver, you get 700, 750, you end up going up to bronze, or go up to gold. And from gold, you do the same thing, you go to platinum. And in platinum, you're basically just trying to get the best that you can in order to reach the camp level. But what platinum is usually, I'm sorry, what? Okay, what, uh, thank you. What if was like, uh, I first tried, but I didn't do well, you know, I want to redo it. How they calculate the score then? Is they use a higher score or they use the average? Because I don't think, you know, like um, the kids, if they are in just a middle school, you know, they are not fully ready for a brown. So they uh, they might not do well in the first time, but I want them to try out how they get the calculated score for the final score. Okay, that's a good question. The way that score calculation tends, it, it tends to work, problems have test cases in them where like generally a problem will have somewhere from 10 to 20 test cases. And there are three problems per contest. So you have anywhere from 30 to 60 test cases in a, in, in, um, in, in a contest. And the way it works is 
you basically each each, uh, each test case if there if there are 30 test cases then each test case is worth a thousand over 30 which is like about 33 i think and because of that each problem is worth about 333 points generally speaking each test case is weighed to be a thousand over the number of test cases in the in in the competition so if you have 60 test cases then you have a thousand over 60 is the amount that it is per test case if that makes sense because it, it does it doesn't always work it used to be the case where contests used to have only like maybe like 10 to 12 test cases but as of around like maybe like 2020 they started adding significantly more to some of them like I, I if I recall correctly there was one silver contest which had a problem that had probably around like 30 test cases 30 to 40. That all programming also has like math problems as well it's all programming yeah, yeah it's, it's all it's all programming there's I mean well it's programming but it can use math in there I mean there's no reason why there is not necessarily math in it I at least I think I believe well, most of the problems, if I mean, if, if, if it's bronze and silver, there's not going to be pure math usually. Pure math usually only occurs in the higher divisions. So you, that's, okay. that's not a direct worry, at least as of now. But in gold and platinum, usually math tends to occur whenever, if it, if it appears, it appears. But bronze and silver, you're usually okay from for the most part. Like they haven't attacking algebra yet. Do you think it's a good time for them to start the UC code already? If they haven't finished the algebra yet. Finish. Oh well. In, in terms of math content, you only. I mean, if if they know how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and do like powers of numbers, like the power, like two to the fourth, if they know arithmetic to a reasonable extent, they know a good amount of it. Then there's no reason to not try. It would be. I mean, if you know the programming language, you know how to do basic math. Like you, like you don't need to know how to solve quadratic equations for use ago per se. You don't need to know that. Okay, got it. You haven't really answered my question is about how the, what if you repeat the test? You know, oh. first time you got like a hundred, second time you got a thousand, how they give you the final your score? Well, the way that it works is the contestant takes the test. It takes, they, 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 they do the Olympiad. It's four hours, they do it for four hours, they get, they finish. The contest closes and then after the contest completes, which usually the contest period is usually from a Friday to a Monday. And mm -hmm. the way it works is after they finish, the Usico graders, they 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 compute the scores for each contestant using like an automatic grader. And then they say, after the contest, this is the score that you got, and this is the percentage that you get in them in the competitors of the contest. So it tells you, it not only tells you the score you got, but also tells you how you ranked in comparison to the contestants. But this is just an anecdotal thing, also, because because also for me, because I started I started doing used to go pretty late in comparison to most people that ended up at where I am and how I've done. But in my early stages, I I, I can certainly say the first bronze contest I took, oh you know, um, the first silver contest I took, I mean, the first silver contest I took, I I I messed it up decently, what like badly. But, and then of course, after you learn, you learn how to solve the problems, you read the editorials that they, 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 that they give you. Because if you see something you don't know, you can't solve it. You have to figure it out after, you have to see what it says. So the important thing is to maintain a constructive mindset when trying to solve these problems, right? Because you're not gonna get anywhere if you think, I don't know this, so then I'm not gonna do it anymore. You have to, you have to see, okay, I didn't, I didn't get this problem in the contest. I need to solve it after and see if I can solve it now. If you can solve it now, then you learn a new thing and you can apply it after. So for instance, there was one problem which used some graph theory things that I didn't know at the time. I said, oh, okay, I don't know this, but I can try to solve this. And I didn't solve it, evidently. But then after the contest, I said, okay, I didn't know this. Let me read what, what the people that made the problem said the answer should be. And let me try to recode my answer. I did it and I got it. And then I learned the concept after. And that's just how the use of go works. You, you counter something, you don't understand it, you try it out, you fail, you read what it actually should be, then you use optimize. You can totally go and go and go. And that's why I don't think it's not good to get caught up in what math they should know, what they don't know, because the math they know probably now is probably even enough, honestly. Okay, I see. What's your highest achievement? Is a platinum, like a first place, second place, something like that? How, how this, what's your highest achievement in terms of musical? I'm in gold right now, but okay. Okay. in terms of position, I don't know. I don't think I've ever gotten I've, I've never scored a perfect score in any contest, but I've gotten, when I promoted from bronze, I, I got like an 
870, I think. And then when I promoted from silver, I ended up getting like a 750. Okay. And then from gold, I've gotten close many times, but I okay. haven't ended up actually promoting. How much time, uh, last question, I know I, I use a lot of time, but uh, how much time you need to spend to prepare this tag? Like a, a tremendous, tremendous, like 20% of your time is of your study time, or it's like a, you just prepare right before the test. How much work you need to spend to prepare this test? I, it honestly depends per person a bit. At least, I mean, obviously some people are better than others, people are smarter than others in certain regards, but at least for me, I know that I put a good amount of time in for a lot of the things. From the, the gap from, for personally for me, and for a lot of people that I've heard from, the gap from bronze to silver isn't that hard to get, isn't that hard to breach. Or the, mm -hmm. the gap from silver to gold is very hard to breach. Oh. Generally speaking, it's pretty hard. Because the thing is from silver, you're going from things that are like, I mean, it's still, it's pretty reasonable. And even in silver, silver is not easy. Like even though it's a second lowest division, it's still not that easy. And from you're, then you're going to gold, which is in and of itself, its own difficulty of things. But generally speaking for me, the most amount of time I ended up studying for years ago was probably my summer going into junior year, which is what, what was that? two summers ago. I ended up, I think I ended up studying probably like per week, probably like 15 to 20 hours per week wow. for it. That's a lot. Okay, I got it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, obviously, you can practice within during the school year, just at a lesser amount, and just make sure you understand certain things. Yeah, but good to know. There's a not um, uh, correl uh, um, right. correl correlation of the mathematics. It's good to <laughs> yeah. know that. Yeah. Well, well, no, okay. Well, if you're good at math, you'll be good at Yusuko. Oh, yeah, but, of course. But, but um, it's not necessarily say if you don't know the math exactly. and you cannot attend. Okay, yes. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, all of the participants for today. If you uh, want to know more about the Yusuko, we are about to start it, uh, Start our Yusuko at August, uh, the end of August and uh, September. So I uh, haven't decided the date yet, but uh, we must, um, yeah, before the, um, the, the class, I mean, the competition, right? So yeah, it's gonna be the December, like ACSL, so yeah. So pay attention uh, about our announcement. Thank you all. And thank you, Matthew, again, for today's presentation. All right. Okay, then we are good to go and for end up and uh, today's present. Thank you all. Thank you, Matthew. We'll get back to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.